right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today is Tuesday, June the 7th. Welcome to the Madison City Council meeting. Great to see so many bright, cheerful faces here tonight. Um, we have a great agenda for this evening, and like all of our meetings, we will rise and uh, remove our hats, bow our heads, and recite the Lord's Prayer, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, then we'll get to the meeting. Thank you. Guests, uh, again, welcome tonight, and I'll ask our clerk for a roll call. Here. 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 We do have a quorum. Council, uh, our last meeting was May 17th. You have before you the Common Council minutes. I have a motion to approve uh, the minutes uh, or suggest amendments. I move that we approve the minutes as written. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, thank you. All right, council, um, tonight we will, we also have a uh, public hearing and I'd like to recess the regular council meeting and call to order the public hearing for the Indiana Office of uh, uh, Community and Rural Affairs, Okra concerning closing out the small business grants uh, from the State Community Development Block Grant uh, Phase 3. So I'll invite Jody up to the podium here to walk us through the uh, presentation from Southeast Indiana Regional Planning Commission. So if you'll hit your mic, please, I'll turn you on there. Thank you. Oh, okay. Hi, um, I am Jody Kummer with the Southeastern Indiana Regional Planning Commission, and we were the grant administrators for this uh, project. Um, in response to the uh, 2020 COVID issue, the Indiana Department or Indiana Office of Community and Rural Affairs established a COVID-19 response fund uh, that was available to, to communities to apply for. Those funds were to help small businesses. Um, apply for grants to um, support and, and help them manage through that, that what had happened, you know. And uh, those grants range from between $5,000 and $10,000. Uh, this was phase three. They did have three different phases, and this particular grant was for phase three, and it was for $250,000, and that was the amount that was awarded, awarded to the city. Of that $250,000, the city spent $150,150 um, to help uh, benefit small businesses and $14,100 in non-CDBG. So that would have been your local match for the project. You su uh, gave support to 18 businesses and that totaled 76 low to moderate income persons, that percent is 93.83, and five were non-low to mod of those employees that worked for the businesses. Uh, so tonight is the second public hearing, um, just closing out that project. Close out paperwork um, has been submitted. We just have to hold the, and it's actually been reviewed by OCRA, so we're just kind of holding this sec second hearing to see if there's any comments from the public, and then I will submit the the minutes to uh, Okra for review. Does anybody have any questions? Sorry, thank you for being here tonight. And uh, she did have a sign-in sheet since this was public hearing. If anyone is present and didn't sign the sign-in sheet, we'll ask her uh, ask to do that now. I think I I think I everybody. This was a great program. We appreciate your assistance on this and all the other many grants that we work with SERPC on uh, and Okra. Yeah, thank you. OK, that's it. Short pretty short and sweet so okay. thank well thank you very much yes I appreciate it so. 
Thank you. Uh, Jody's also working with us on other grants that we have outstanding right now, one in particular, Crystal Beach, yeah. that we're working on with Okra, yeah. uh, and uh, we have a long, long relationship with Surfsea. Thank you. If there are no comments or questions for Jody, we will adjourn the public hearing uh, regarding the closing of the state CDBG grant related to the COVID-19 response. And I'd like to uh, call our regular council meeting back to order and in mention to the uh, audience tonight and those who are out there watching that we are also uh, recording this meeting uh, and streaming it on the City of Madison YouTube channel. Thank you, Jody. All right, um, let's move on. So I do not believe we have any presentation, petitions, memorials, remonstrances, introduction, motions, and guests. So we'll move to the resolutions or bills. Uh, good evening, counselors. Uh, my name is Tony Steiner, Director of Economic Development. Before you tonight is a resolution 2022-39C, a resolution amending uh, 76 2018, which is the Riverfront Liquor License uh, Resolution. As you're all aware, the state law was passed um, <clears throat> to create the Riverfront District Licenses. In 2018, the current administration and council created um, the process uh, for Madison to have riverfront licenses. <clears throat> Today, after three years with that program, we're recommending some, some changes to build upon the successes we've had and to fill in some of those gaps that we've now found in the community. But we've also wanted to continue to honor the past council and community in the input that they gave in the 2018 um, ordinance. So the goal of our process <clears throat> was is to spur greater economic development within our historic downtown district, which sees over 350,000 unique visitors a year. Um, we want to continue to improve and create destination experiences in our restaurants. Uh, our current Fairfield Inn was ranked number one in the world for a couple weeks. Uh, they're still ranked number three, but one of the main concerns that they're getting from their guests is the variety and, and uh, types of restaurants available in, in downtown Madison. We wanted to streamline the process, having talked to the current license holders, talked to the ABC, um, excise, uh, current three-way liquor license holders, uh, potential new licensors, current restaurant um, uh, owners. Uh, we wanted to streamline the process. And we wanted to increase the quality and collaboration of those license holders within the district uh, with the rest of the Riverfront District. So at this time, I will introduce Alyssa to go through the changes uh, briefly uh, and outline those uh, for your consideration tonight, and we're here to answer questions. If you want me to tell you to read it real Let's quick? See. Yes, why don't you read yep. it? It's resolution number 2022-39C, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, amending the 2018-76 resolution. Whereas Indiana Code 7.1-3-20-16D enables municipality to create a riverfront development district within its economic development area. And whereas Indiana Code 7.1-3-20-16D allows for and authorizes the issuance of specified non-transferable permits to sell alcoholic beverages for consumption in a restaurant within a municipal riverfront development district. And whereas the amended resolution 2018-76 allows the City of Madison to have established the City of Madison Riverfront Development District herein attached as set forth as Exhibit A and to allow for the issuance of permits and sale of alcoholic beverages within the City of Madison Riverfront Development District under the amended local guidelines attached and set forth as Exhibit B. And now therefore be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana that the following states the following. The area set out in Exhibit A shall be the City of Madison Riverfront Development District contemplated by Indiana Code 7.1-3-20-16 and 16.1. The Council shall allow for the granting of one, two, and three-way Riverfront Development District licenses. The City of Madison will have the authority to grant the number of licenses within the district by resolution under Indiana Code 7.3-3-20-16 Section A. Each applicant for the City of Madison Riverfront Development District filed within the 
with the Indiana Alcohol and Tobacco Commission must be accompanied with a written letter of support from the mayor from the city of Madison for both new applicants and renewal applications. The council shall allow for the granting of 10 one, two, or three-way riverfront development district li liquor licenses. All licenses can be granted for the purpose of a restaurant. Up to three can be granted for the purpose of a cultural experience venue. And the city of Madison, the Madison City Council will have the authority to grant additional licenses within the district by future resolution. The rules set forth in Exhibit B are hereby adopted. These rules and local guidelines shall serve as the criteria by which the Economic Development Department, the Mayor, and the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, determines whether the applicant should receive the aforementioned letter requesting for approval of the application of the renewal or renewal application. The monies granted, generated from these fees, will be used for riverfront district recruitment and community economic development activities and be placed in the Economic Development NRO Fund. A new or renewal applications approved in 2022 will be will abide by the guidelines set forth in the resolution and condition of eligibility pursuant to Indiana Code 7.1-3-19-17 section A. Thank you, Mr. Jenner. Alyssa, you want to run through the changes, please? Yes. So the 10 major changes that we created um, in the guidelines, the first one is the elimination of the Riverfront Liquor Alcohol Beverage Committee. Um, this committee nor going through council is a requirement by state law. Uh, a lot of the other cities do not go through that process as well, but we decided to keep the process of going through council because it was important, but the committee was redundant um, and we're just trying to streamline the process. The second change is we're asking for an increase of licenses. Um, we currently have five and we're asking for a total of 10, so five more. Um, the third change is that up to three of the 10 licenses can be used for venues. Um, this was a need that we found in this community as we wanted to support the Madison music, music movement in creating more opportunities for venues for cultural experiences. And the requirements for that are that the venue can hold a minimum of 125 people, um, that they have live entertainment, and they must adhere to the state food minimum. Um, the fourth change is that we increase the minimum of um, amount of food sales for restaurants. It was originally 100K for the first and second year, and then it changed to 125K for the third year and beyond. Um, and now we are asking that it be 200K for the first and second year and 275K for the third year and beyond. The fifth change was that we lowered the days required to be open for the restaurants. Um, the current license holders expressed that with the seasonality of tourism in Madison, this number, this new number would make a lot more sense. Um, we also specify now that this number will include holidays and seasonal shutdown. The number originally was to be open for 275 days, and now it is 240 days, um, or will be. <clears throat> the six changes, we increased the local fee for application and created a fee for the renewal application. This was important so that there is some sort of cost to obtaining a license and all money will be reinvested back into the district to support economic um, development activity. We increased the original application from $250 to $1,500 and the renewal fee will now be $1,000 locally. Um, number seven, we added that a new applicant um, must not oversaturate the market. We had concerns of existing license holders that are continuing, that we would continue to give license out to the same or similar restaurant. And this will allow for us to evaluate the applicant in order to be sure that they're adding to the district. The eighth change is that we added the applicant must support collaboration. Adding this enforces a good business district and supports other businesses in any way that they can as a collaborative partner. Um, the ninth change is that we revised the application and renewal application. We updated these documents to reflect the new guidelines, which is Exhibit B, um, and, ha and to have more of a friendly process when applying. And the tenth um, big change that we made is we added the condition of eligibility. This states the state statutes and district requirements established by council, all based upon ATC recommendations for enforcement. Any questions?
I think we actually need a motion to approve if somebody wants is wants to make that motion in a second, then you can have discussion. I move to approve resolution number 2022-39C as presented. I'll second. Okay. Is there any discussion? Any questions or discussion from the audience? Hearing, oh. Yeah, this, these are for restaurants and other places of business. It seems like jacking it up that much for uh, application as well as reapplication. That seems kind of steep, I think, uh, isn't it? Okay. Talking about the cost? Yeah. The application fee? Thousand dollars. The state requires that if they charge the city a thousand dollars and five hundred for renewal. So basically, it's five hundred dollars more than what we paid at the state, and that money will be going towards economic development. Yeah, everything does. All right. Thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions? Oh, uh, on that on that same point, Kevin Watkins. Um, on that same point. Uh, the, the licensing fee, that's the only fee, I mean, it says to the city, but that covers our state license fee as well each year with renewal? Okay. That's not in addition. It does not. That it does not. That, that is a fee locally, and then there's also the state fee that also does apply. Okay. So we currently pay the $1,000 license annually. Yes. We would pay an additional 1000 and is that an annual renewal that, every year? That is Any other questions or comments? Hearing and seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Krebs? Yes. Lisa Dittillo? Yes. James Bartlett? Yes. Curtis Chatham? Yes. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council. The next thing on the agenda is an ordinance on first reading, and that is ordinance number 2022-9, an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, amending the zoning map of the City of Madison, Indiana. Whereas, it has been the recommendation of the City of Madison Area Plan Commission to the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana to amend the zoning map of the City of Madison, Indiana. Whereas, on May 18th, 2022, the, city, the Madison Planning Commission has voted to recommend to the Common Council of the City of Madison that the zoning of the following described property be changed from general business to medium density residential, which is R8. And that's at the addresses of 1720 Craigmont and 1728 Craigmont. Whereas it's in the best interest of the City of Madison and citizens that the zoning map be amended accordingly, and whereas the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana concurs with the recommendations submitted to it by the Planning Commission. Now, therefore, it be ordained by the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, that the City of Madison zoning map be amended so that the zoning for the following described property be changed from general business to medium density residential, R8, which is 720, 1720 Craigmont Street and 1728 Craigmont Street. And that this ordinance shall be in full force and effect and from and after this date. So that's on first reading. I'll go to second reading. Council, are there any reports, recommendations, or other business from standing or select study committees to the city council? Report on? Okay. Uh, we'll move on to uh, report to city officials, but we also have an invited guest tonight, is, which is Jefferson County, uh, who is Jefferson County's Emergency Management Agency Director, Troy Morgan. Uh, Troy, welcome to the podium. I invited Troy up here uh, to really do a kind of a public awareness announcement because, as you know, we experienced severe weather uh, during spring and summer, so I'm grateful for... Uh, Troy being here tonight and sharing with the community uh, some tips on uh, being prepared. Welcome, Troy. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, Hit that red button there. And there, there you go. go. There we go. Thank you. Everybody hear me now? Okay. What's that? Yeah. Um, evening, Council, and thank you, Mayor, for the uh, invitation. Um, we originally started talking about tornado season and tornado awareness and Rather than getting into anything in very specific, I thought it would be uh, better if we just kind of went over a very generic presentation. This is a PowerPoint that I use for a lot of outreach um, opportunities. It's not very long. It won't be death by PowerPoint, I promise. Um, but um, 
it, it's, it's intended to uh, provoke thought and encourage conversation and questions. So as we're going through it real quick, holler at me, throw your hand up. Anybody behind me, do the same thing. Um, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of discussion as we move through this. So without my glasses on, I'm going to assume that's the right arrow button. Um, obviously, that's just our uh, office address. A couple of years ago, as everybody knows, we moved into the new public safety center, which is at uh, 620 Green Road. Contact information there. Some of the um, responsibilities of EMA, certainly, but are not limited to, is the preparation and coordination of all emergency functions without limitations, and that includes the comprehensive emergency plan or the emergency management operation plan for the entire community and county. Uh, provisions of emergency management programs uh, that enable the state of Indiana and the political subdivisions to mitigate against, prepare for, respond to, and recover from all hazards, whether natural or man-made, including acts of terrorism, both foreign and domestic. So people always say, well, exactly what do you do? And the easiest way for me to, to relay that to the common uh, folk is to say, uh, you know, if there's a car crash on Main Street, I, I have nothing to do with that. However, if it's a chartered bus that's full of hundreds of people, then that becomes an EMA problem. If a house catches on fire, it's not an EMA problem or not an EMA issue. However, if, you know, the house catches on fire and ends up burning an entire block, and then that becomes a disaster and that, that, that becomes an EMA issue. So it really all depends upon the magnitude of what we're talking about. Uh, what is the difference between emergencies and disasters? Um, disasters are usually large-scale events. Uh, they typically involve a broader geographic area and affect the general population as a whole, and the duration is usually extended. An emergency is usually generally a much smaller event and happens in a much smaller area of time <coughs> or uh, geographic area and for a shorter period of time. So that's, that's kind of the difference between those two. Some examples of emergencies and disasters, of course, power outages, windstorms, tornadoes, widespread fire, uh, mass casualty, hazmat, uh, explosions, terrorism. Just a few pictures there. My favorite one is the, the tree root flying through the air during a tornado. Um, disaster strikes, uh, how does the process begin? And we have some uh, experience with that here in the last year or two. Uh, after the response is over and after the threat of life and safety is, is, uh, is beyond or is past, uh, EMA then switches gears and goes into uh, the, the damage assessment mode. Everything has to start with the damage assessment process, which is conducted by emergency management. After that uh, assessment is conducted, the results of that assessment uh, is uh, given uh, as, uh, as advice or as a report to the government executives, whether it be the mayor in the city of Madison, the commissioners in, out in the county. And then based on uh, the results of that assessment and the discussion with the executives, then we'll choose the appropriate plan from the county's comprehensive emergency management plan and decide what to do about it or how we're best going to move forward. Uh, EMA request or will request and provide an emergency declaration to the government executives. There's a certain format or a certain template that has to be included, all the language and all the T's and the I's dotted and crossed, that has to be included before it's submitted to Indianapolis for consideration of any other further requests for resources. Um, and depending upon if it's a city, strictly a city um, issue, then of course we'll work with the mayor as we did with the, with the recent flooding. If it's countywide, uh, then that would involve uh, for sure the county commissioners, but would probably, if there's damage in the city, that would in include it, kind of be a, a bilateral effort. Um, if local resources are exhausted, the reason that we send that declaration locally uh, to Indianapolis is that way they already ha kind of have the little heads up as to what's going on. But in order for us to request state resources, they have to have that local declaration from, from the local jurisdiction. Uh, but then additional resources and responses that would be received from uh, Indianapolis then would be coordinated through our emergency operations center where representatives of those affected um, uh, area or jurisdictions would be, whether you know during the flooding the mayor and, and his staff uh, were, were in our operations center and, and that's where you know, the declaration was signed and transmitted to Indianapolis from there. So. Um, if state resources are taxed, um, 
then the governor will also <coughs> declare an emergency if it's something that doesn't just affect Madison or doesn't just affect Jefferson County or not even just southeast Indiana. You know, if it's wide scale, such as an earthquake or, or God forbid, something else or worse, uh, you know, we may need to, um, the governor would need to declare that emergency. We might need to request federal assistance. In order to receive federal assistance, then the state declaration would be forwarded to Washington. And then when and if signed by the president, that's what triggers FEMA and other federal resources at that particular time. So what can we do to prepare for those types of things? First and foremost is information before the event, similar to what we're doing here, the purpose of what we're talking about tonight. Uh, we, it's good to know what the potentials in our area are. So we're probably not going to have to prepare for a tsunami here in Jefferson County. But there's a lot of other things that we have to consider, whether it's earthquake or wildfire or uh, tornadoes or whatever the case may be. But we need to be aware of what those exposures to which hazards that, that, that may affect us. Um, we need to try and figure out how to avoid as much as possible, what to do in the event that one of those happen, and most importantly, discuss them with your family. Anyone that has small children or people that are not of legal age or able to make their own decisions, we need to make sure and, and uh, communicate with them so that it's easier to deal with at the time that something might happen. And then make a plan. Uh, that plan uh, should include all members of your family, young, old, um, infirmed, uh, special needs, whatever the case may be. And uh, in this, this uh, last line is, is for the softer side of folks and for my wife in particular. She would be upset if I didn't mention the pets and, and the other livestock. But it's, it's amazing that people don't think about, <clears throat> they, they leave their pets behind. They don't turn their livestock out. They don't make you know, provisions for it. So that ends up becoming an emergency in itself. If the livestock becomes victim and the livestock dies and nobody knows the livestock was there, then that becomes a, an animal a health emergency, which becomes a human public emergency. So that all has to be considered in part of the planning process. But take your dogs and cats with you if you have to so how you make a plan, everybody knows how to make a plan. Uh, everybody plans every day, and this is just an example. I told you I was going to mess that up at least. So this is just a real quick clip that shows you how you already know how to make a plan. I like to play it for everybody. You can go ahead and video and make me feel better. So the video um, is just talks about birthday parties, um, parents' 50th anniversary celebrations, wedding receptions, and and how we plan for things every day. You know, we, we plan for barbecues on the weekends. We plan for all of the fine details of all of the events that we that we like or we enjoy or that are fun. So <clears throat> it's very very easy to just change the focus of that planning effort and plan on or focus on, on what you need to plan for to try and uh, prepare for, for whatever might happen. And I'm going to give you some links to where you can go to find that information here in just a little bit. But what you can expect after you've made that plan or in the event something should happen, um, part of your plan should help you or should address how you will become self-sufficient for at least 72 hours. You may be on your own before any state, federal, or even local resources might be able to reach you depending upon what's happened, where you are, and what's wrong. Whoop, sorry. Um, the need for help might be widespread. Let's keep that in mind. So if you call 911 and you get a busy signal, that's entirely possible. Disasters and 911 busy signals sometimes go hand in hand. You don't, may not always get them on the first try. And that's if the system isn't already compromised and down for some other reason. So uh, have full realization that 911 might not be might not be there. Uh, if you can wait, try and wait. 
if you need immediate help, try and seek it out. It's okay if, if you have absolutely no idea what to do and your life's in danger, you need to figure out what your, your uh, best uh, resource is. And if you need to call 911, call it. But if you've got a tree down in your backyard and the entire community is destroyed, but you're okay and there's nothing going on, you know, we, we would encourage you to just wait that 72 hours out, go through your emergency plan, take care of your emergency supplies, and, and try not to burden the system with, with, your, with your needs if, if it's not life-threatening. So learning to be self-reliant, uh, responders and resources are likely to be stretched to the breaking point, as we just kind of talked about, and it may take time for help to arrive. Uh, if your life isn't immediately threatened, be patient. Someone else could actually need the help a little bit worse than what, what we might. And uh, know your neighbors. If they're elderly or have uh, problems or other needs, uh, check on them and, and help where you, where you can. A lot of times, um, people who think they're victims actually end up being first responders. In an actual disaster, the help that you get might not be from a first responder. It might be from a neighbor. Uh, it, might, it might take that long for uh, you know, a police officer or a firefighter or a paramedic or somebody to get to you, but your neighbor might be there first. So uh, maybe you could be that neighbor. Um, home disaster kits. We talk about, you know, there's two types of kits. You can have a home disaster kit and a mobile or uh, disaster kit or a, a go bag, a go kit. Uh, in your home kit, uh, water is always the first and foremost thing that, if, that someone should think about. Uh, and the, the 111 rule applies. You should try and plan for one gallon of water per person per day. So a family of four for two weeks is going to need about 56 gallons of clean, fresh water that you might not be able to go to the tap after the disaster and get. Um, I'm not suggesting by any means that we all become preppers and doomsday survivalists and but I think we should all be smart and should have, you know, what we what we need and what we think we might might need. Um, I know that that my uh, my outlook. I mean, I've been in emergency services all my entire uh, career for many many years, and I thought that I was you know tough and going to survive it. But after taking over an EMA five years ago, it, some of the exposure that I've had to some of the training and some of the materials actually changed my way of thinking just a little bit. Uh, I don't have. Like I said, I don't have a whole horde of things, but, but I do have a few preparations that I didn't have five years ago. So this is part of that. Uh, food or shelf-stable food, um, obviously you don't want you know fresh meat and things you're going to have to cook and you know, not, not be able to. But if you can pop a can and scoop a fork full of something out of the can, that's the kind of stuff you want to have on your shelves. You want to make sure and have any type of medication or prescriptions that you would have to have and have a couple of weeks of those stored off, off to the side. Most physicians understand that need. Most physicians will work with you and give you the extra prescription, and you can keep those on hand as well. You want to have a basic toolkit. You don't need, you know, Tim the Toolman Taylor's garage or anything, but a basic set of pliers, a hammer, a screwdriver, just, you know, a knife, just you know, your basic tools. Uh, you want to have a radio, uh, battery-operated radio, or more preferably one with a hand crank or both. Radios now that have solar panels and hand cranks and they're battery operated, and I would recommend one of those. Uh, and also a first aid kit doesn't have to be anything you could do surgery with, but needs to be something that you could treat, you know, lacerations and even broken bones with. Um, some sort of a light source, battery operated, uh, chargers for your cell phone should cell phones still work, uh, or other types of uh, energy battery solar pack devices that you might want to, you know, charge uh, something else from. We talked about the go bag or the portable kit. Uh, in that, again, water is always the most important. Obviously, you're not going to put 56 gallons of water in a backpack, but you know you should be able to get as many bottles of water in there as you can, three or four. So if you have to grab that bag and leave your house in a hurry, you, you're not leaving without some some water to sustain you for a little bit. Uh, again, food. You're probably not going to want to put a lot of cans of food in there, but uh, energy bars, protein snacks, you know, all shelf stable items. Again. A few dollars, extra, a few extra dollars won't hurt. Uh, instead of the tool kit, I recommend a multi-tool. You have just as many things on a multi-tool as what you have in a basic tool kit, but you don't have to have the big tool bag or the toolbox. Uh, Multi-tools take up a whole lot less room. Uh, first aid supplies, again, are a first small first aid kit. Um, I'd throw a couple changes of clothes in there, or at least the important clothes, the underclothes. 
uh, maybe an emergency blanket if you get caught out somewhere and don't have any other kind of shelter. Um, any of, copies of any important documents, birth certificates, social security cards, uh, identification, any, anything that you feel, any type of documentation that you feel would be uh, important should you not be able to return home. Um, and just kind of think of your go bag or your mobile disaster kit as a mini version of the home kit. And again, I'm going to give you a link at the end that you can actually go to and get full and complete lists of, of all this sort of stuff. Water again uh, is um, the most important, as, as I mentioned. Um, you know, you can live uh, for weeks without food, but only for a few days without water. Um, so water is always, always, always more important than food. Uh, you should stockpile a minimum of a gallon of water per day per person in the household. Uh, tap water uh, can be safely stored in sealed containers in cool, dark places such as closets or basements for two to three months. After that two or three months, you're going to want to exchange it out and get fresh water. Uh, and then, you know, everybody has a uh, supply of hot water or supply of clean water in their house should power or utilities go out. If you've got an 80-gallon hot water heater, you've got 80 gallons of fresh water. Uh, I wouldn't waste it on a shower. I'd turn it off, let it cool off, and I'd, I'd use that for emergency water. Talking about a first aid kit, um, a well-stocked first aid kit, and should all should consider learning first aid if, if you're not from that type of a background. Uh, in a crisis, medical care may be delayed, and, and uh, you need to be prepared to treat family for minor injuries and even broken bones. Uh, the Red Cross and hospitals uh, offer free and inexpensive courses in first aid, and I would recommend every adult in every household who's preparing for a disaster should take at least a basic first aid course and or a CPR course. CPR will not teach you first aid. First aid sometimes typically teaches you CPR even though you may not be certified in CPR. Uh, battery powered items, your battery operated radio should be able to receive AM and FM channels, shortwave and police bands or a plus if, if they're that type of a radio. Um, uh, they can also give you early warning signs of danger. Uh, battery powered flashlights, uh, weather radios, and, and extra batteries. That particular radio you see there actually has a flashlight, it has a hand crank, it has a solar panel, and also has a little charging cable, so it kind of does a little bit of everything. But those type of devices are usually relatively inexpensive at Walmart and those types of places, and I would recommend that that be part of your, your kits and supplies. Severe weather warnings, um, local TV stations, they have weather apps for your phone and those are always at no cost. EMA has a mass notification system that rebroadcasts all of the National Weather Service alerts. Local radios do, uh, does a good job of uh, uh, rebroadcasting and transmitting those. Uh, but the most important thing um, is the weather radio that you see a little picture of there. Those are about $35, $40 at Walmart, Kroger sells them. Uh, all of your uh, big box stores sell them, uh, but that's that. Those for going to bed at night, you know, a tornado after dark is one of the scariest things that I think somebody in the Midwest could experience. This will at least give you that extra two or three minutes to get up, get out of bed, and at least get down the hallway to the closet or maybe even into the basement. So uh, they're they're well worth the money and and well worth the effort. Just making those part of your plan as well. Uh, we talked about the EMA <coughs> mass notification system. Um, a little less than a year ago, uh, EMA made the decision to switch to a new system. We used to have the system called Nixle. We now have the Rave Mobile Safety uh, System, and uh, it will rebroadcast all of the National Weather Service information and uh, rebroadcast that out to those who choose to do that um, or choose to receive those. You can uh, personalize your account, and you can pick and choose what you want to get how much, how little, what time of day, you can set quiet times, all that sort of stuff. Uh, the link to that is found on our website, which is jeffersoncounty.in.gov forward slash EMA. But if you just want to text uh, Jefferson EMA to the 81437, that will automatically enroll your cell phone for the tornado warnings. So that is only for the tornado warning. So if all you care about is a tornado and only a tornado warning, just simply text Jefferson EMA to that number and you'll get that alert on your phone if the National Weather Service ever issues a tornado warning for our, for our county or for our community. On that, uh, the county website though, on the EMA webpage, the jeffersoncounty.in.gov slash EMA, there is also a link 
uh, on the left hand side there it says get prepared. I also gave you a couple of samples uh, printed out there uh, on your desk uh, as just a couple of examples of all of the great documents that are on that web page. I didn't print them all because it, there's multiple pages and multiple documents and you'd had a stack of papers in front of you. But that's just to give you a sample of the type of material. But there is um, flood specific, tornado specific, uh, all hazards. There's how to make a plan, a template for your home plan. There's a family communications plan. There's checklists for your home kit. There's checklists for your go bag. All the information that we just talked about a little bit about here is, is on that web of course, that's our office number if you have any questions or trouble with any of that. And then the link off of our webpage is to that ready.gov. And there's all of those documents that I mentioned and, and a lot more. And that's actually a FEMA uh, supported um, website. So that's always a, a good um, source of information as well. And probably aside from water being the most important thing, the second most important thing is I encourage everybody to get involved. Don't just sit back and wait for it to happen. Um, everybody can get involved. Um, this community is a community of volunteerism. Uh, we have a, vo a great volunteer fire department system. Uh, law enforcement has volunteers within their ranks, uh, both city and county. Um, there's the amateur radio clubs that are very active in emergency management in this community. Uh, Red Cross, Salvation Army, but I encourage anybody who doesn't want to just sit and wait for it to happen, who wants to be part of the solution, wants to be part of how we fix things or how we prepare for things, to reach out and get involved. Go, go to your neighborhood fire station, call your chief of police, call your sheriff, uh, depending upon where you live, and just say, hey, I'm interested. Is there anything I can do? And, and just get, get the information and or ask for that information. And uh, I don't think anybody will tell you no. They'll, they'll give you the, some answers and point you in the right direction and uh, I, I would encourage that but there's all sorts of other community organizations out there this just lists a few so um, and with that that's I, I went through it really really quick so I didn't want to waste a lot of your all's time but if there's any questions is there comments from anybody anywhere I'd be happy to engage in that discussion and talk, talk Troy I want to say thank you um, the emergency preparedness is something that's so critical and I wanted you here, uh, invited you here tonight to just remind the community how important that is. I mean, just in the last year alone, we've, you know, uh, endured a global health pandemic, flash flood. Uh, we had this snow emergency where we had to go to red alert on roads. We've had power outages, down trees. Uh, it can happen at any time. And so being aware and definitely having situation, situational awareness is critical and we're very very fortunate that Troy is our director of EMA and that we have the uh, uh, the ops center to go to when the emergency does strike so that we can still have continuity of our functions and emergency response and he mentioned earlier about all the disaster assessments uh, we went through multiple of those with the flood and that is all across different state and federal agencies and it was a lot of work. So the more we can be prepared and the, and the more drills we can do that to keep driving home uh, the value of emergency preparedness and planning, uh, I'm all in favor of. Thank you for being here tonight. And happy to turn, turn the floor over to anybody else for other questions with Troy. Thanks for having me. Troy, thank you. Uh, come back more often. We love seeing you. Glad to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Council, we'll move on to uh, reports. We'll invite uh, America's Chief John I. Wallace. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, before I get started, I would too like to thank Troy and his staff. They just do an awesome job. Quite often I've called Troy at 2 or 3 in the morning. Uh, he's called me over different situations, and he's always willing to jump in and help out. And if you've never been to the emergency center on Green Road, you should stop by and check out the uh, situational room, if you want to call it that. It's uh, it's really second to none, and I think everybody would be taken back by such an outstanding facility that we have right here in Jefferson County. So on behalf of the police, thanks, Troy. We appreciate you. <clears throat> Council, we've uh, all but completed our convictions on our sexual predators that uh, 
That operation began back in August of 2020. Uh, we had 20 arrests. We have one left to be sentenced, but at this point in time, we have a 100% conviction rate and over 150 years of sentencing as a result of this operation. Something that uh, it's sad to, that we have to do, but very proud of the operation and the efforts uh, put forth by the officers. Our last one to be sentenced was Rick Deck. He received 32 years. Because Mr. Deck is a habitual offender, uh, so his his uh, sentencing was enhanced. So, again, hats off to everybody involved, um, to our prosecutor David Sutter, and to our judges who found the need to hand down harsh sentences on these uh, very sick, uh, twisted individuals. MPD's been busy. We've uh, obviously written a lot of uh, citations, uh, a lot of traffic stops, a lot of activity, as you can see in your your monthly report. Um, one thing that we are excited about and proud of, we've been trying to visit uh, different clubs, uh, events uh, throughout the summer. Yesterday we visited the Light White Boys and Girls Club with our with our K-9 Kane and his handler Nicole and, uh, and Officer Perry. Very good turnout, very good response from the kids. So we are really going to make a valid attempt to continue to do that throughout the summer as we find that very important to, uh, to continue to reach out, to, especially to our children allow them to see us in a different light. And through our canine program, that is something certainly that, that helps us do that. So we're very proud of that operation. We have hired Andrew Gibbs. Uh, he is a police officer who comes to us from uh, VV uh, PD. And for keeping track, that's two we've stole from him. But hey, we got to do what you got to do in this stuff <laughs> here at times. So Andrew's a, uh, a tier one uh, academy graduate and, uh, and I think a very fine young man. He and Kyle Lane, who just recently came to us, again, both from VVPD, and, and, and I think our community is going to be well served by, by Officer Gibbs. He'll start with us next Monday, uh, June 13th. So we're excited to, to have him on board, and we will certainly welcome him. And with that, that's pretty much all I have. I do have a running total uh, with our traffic division of uh, the amount of stops that we have actually made this year, which is 2,172. So. A lot, of, a lot of traffic is being worked. Uh, we certainly heard our citizens uh, cry for those needs. And, um, and with the additions to our department by this council and by the city administration, we're able to go out and, and, and take care of these concerns. So we're not perfect, and there's still a semi slipping by on Main Street, but uh, we're uh, doing a, getting the majority of them anyway. That's all I have, unless the council. Chief, I've gotten a lot of positive response from the community on the, the presence and the visibility. Yes. Foot patrols, bike patrols, golf carts, um, up and down Main Street, on the riverfront, hilltop. Uh, really appreciate uh, the high visibility, and I know that the, the you know the creation of the uh, part-time police yes. uh, resources has been pretty invaluable in that in that respect, but also. You know the assignment of a couple of officers specifically for those duties it's been very noticeable thank you okay. one thing before i do leave i would like to uh, to bring to the council's attention and i mentioned this yesterday to the board of public works and safety and without going into much detail i know we all love the openness of our city hall i love being able to go in and just seeing your city officials uh, sitting there doing their work and and being approachable but well we just can't do it anymore <laughs> In my opinion, we've got to secure City Hall. And uh, the ability to walk in and walk into anybody's office, walk up to any uh, uh, city employee, um, to me is, unfortunately, we live in an area where we can't afford to do that anymore. Um, my recommendation to this administration and, and to this council is that we really look into beefing up our security. Um, and unfortunately, that's going to require probably some enclosures in the city hall. I mean, whether hopefully it can be some glass where we can still see, you know, our city officials working and, and, uh, and come in and feel welcome and, and visit. But uh, um, in good conscience, I just can't see us continuing with the way we're operating at city hall. We need to really consider enhancing our security. And I would recommend, you know, the council member or members uh, to join in with this administration and, and whomever may want to join in and help us out. Uh, but uh, feel strongly that we really need to change our security here at City Hall. And I hate that as much as anybody else because I do love the openness of, of government, but uh, we just can't stand by and, and allow it to uh, continue to be the way it's operating now. And 
light of uh, what's going on in our world, and uh, it just takes that one person that's irritated. You know, we do make decisions here at City Hall that people don't agree with, and uh, and uh, we just don't know which one it's going to be that's, you know, not going to take kindly to it and come in and do harm. So, for this administration, for future administrations, I really think that we need to really need to consider really securing our openness of City Hall. Chief, thank you. I know we look forward to your recommendations. All right, I'll invite uh, Tony Steinhardt, Director of Economic Development, back up. Thank you, Mayor. For an update. Yeah, uh, a couple quick updates before a, a motion of action that I need, need you to uh, take tonight on tax abatement. Real quickly, uh, Sunrise Crossing, I want to update you on, on that project. Um, July 12th is the groundbreaking ceremony, and I'd encourage all, all to attend that uh, within the community as well as city councilors. Make sure you have that on your calendar at 1030 in the morning. Uh, there'll be the ceremonial uh, turning of the dirt and some uh, comments and those sorts of things. Uh, we hope to be able to announce the national retailers uh, at that time as well, July 12th at 1030. Uh, the bonds uh, for that project and support of that project that the city supported uh, will be sold on June 4th, 14th, I'm sorry, June 14th, uh, as well as the Super 8 TV bonds will be sold on, on June 16th. So the due diligence periods are wrapping up quickly here and the final closings uh, will be taking place. I uh, also wanted to let you know that uh, this Thursday uh, we will have a, an uh, economic development um, event for real estate professionals in the community. Um, it's a joint event between the city of Madison and Jefferson County uh, to discuss economic development activity and to get insights from those who are uh, on the ground selling our cities in the front lines. Uh, realtors are the ones selling our community every day. and so want to uh, make sure we get their input as well as uh, insights on what we're doing moving forward. So that event will be uh, this Thursday. We have Mark Fisher, the CEO of the Indiana uh, Realtors Association, uh, joining us as a guest speaker. Uh, that event is at 3 o'clock at the uh, Cotton Mill if the city councilors would like to attend. Uh, tonight is a part of a state statute. Uh, the city council needs to approve um, that certain tax abatements are within substantial com uh, compliance and those are for Trilogy, a Trilogy Real Estate, U.S. Premier Tube, Vehicle Services Group, Grody's Industry, Riverside Tower, Cotton Mill Land Owner LLC. I would ask that those following companies are in substantial compliance with the previously approved personal or real property tax abatements and I would just need a motion and a second. Do you have that those documents for us? I don't see anything regarding those in our packet or anything. There was a tax abatement listings. I gave you the listing that they were in compliance. Would you? I can provide you all of the applications. I know. I don't. We don't need that. You did not get uh, a sheet. Okay. I apologize. We will. Uh, Move that to the next meeting. Move the next one. Okay. Any other updates, Tony? Not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Council, uh, last thing on reports from city officials is an uh, update on the status of our ARPA plan. Uh, in response to the American Rescue Plan Act from first quarter of 2021, on July 20th, 2021, City Council adopted resolution 2021-45 that established a fund to receive monies from the American Rescue Plan Act, more specifically called the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds. Uh, per uh, State Board of Accounts and federal regulations, we created a special fund and then followed that up with the adoption of a local plan that identified four areas in which we were going to make distributions of those dollars. Um, at the time, the uh, uh, interim rule was provided to us. There were some very specific um, uh, standards on what we could use those funds for. We adopted four categories in our local plan for the distribution of the first tranche of SLFR uh, funds in the amount of approximately $1.3 million. And that was for stormwater infrastructure and planning, 
matching grant funds, speeding the recovery of tourism, and premium pay for essential workers. Uh, attached to the update as of June 2022 is an exhibit showing that we have dispersed uh, to date $686,493, which leaves $657,518 $657, left to fund from the first tranche. Uh, the money uh, of uh, $2.6 million comes to us in two tranches, uh, approximately 12 months apart. So we do expect by the end of August to receive tranche B, and upon receiving uh, tranche B, we'll have approximately $2,001,531 uh, in that fund. As you know, we have been earmarking the majority of those funds, uh, awaiting a report back from the Army Corps of Engineers in order to deal with our stormwater issues associated with the Crooked Creek uh, watershed. We should have the uh, first uh, batch of data and recommendations from the Army Corps of Engineers by September. Uh, right now, they're, they're finalizing hydrological and hydraulic analysis of the Crooked Creek watershed. But over the course of the next couple of months, uh, we'll be you know, evaluating that fund and in light of all the capital needs that we have across the community, both in our stormwater infrastructure, water infrastructure, uh, ready economic development grants. Um, we will you know, be evaluating how to use it. Um, the final rule was published in January of 2022, which, goes into, which went into effect April the 1st, which now permits units of government receiving less than $10 million to consider the allocation of funds as public sector revenue re replacement funds. And we can uh, appropriate the monies in a more flexible manner rather than those five uh, primary categories that was in the interim final rule. We still, as I mentioned here, consider the original purpose, uh, which is about investing in infrastructure to be our primary driver of using the funds. Um, but as we evaluate all of our capital needs, we'll be determining how best to uh, appropriate the, the $2 million approximately that we'll have by the end of August. And I will say that I'm grateful for Jefferson County's indicated that they will support our stormwater infrastructure and planning efforts, uh, I believe, by about $250,000. And as uh, Commissioner Bramer indicated here at the last council meeting, um, he's seeking approval from County Council on June the 14th for a million dollar contribution toward our clean drinking water project. Um, Happy to answer any questions, but here's the detail. More to come. There's plenty of need for the funding, and uh, we'll just be very judicious with how we uh, appropriate it so that it's getting put toward the most impactful purposes we can identify. Uh, Mayor, I have a question regarding the uh, speeding the recovery of tourism. Would, would you consider contributing some of that additional, the funds that are left for uh, Riverfest and Chautauqua? Uh, honestly, I would prefer not to because the need for capital investment is so significant. We're doing capital planning right now, or maybe the best response would be, let's maybe table that and then let's uh, present to you the capital plan and you'll see uh, all the problems we need to solve, particularly across our parks. And as you know, we're facing a $2 million uh, problem to resolve in order to you know, further the, the construction initiative on um, Crystal Beach. So but we're like giving $50,000 to the Madison Regatta? That was last, last year. Last year. Okay. Uh, so that, that was a big slug of money that Jefferson County Board of Tourism and the city of Madison contributed in addition to uh, some in-kind um, contribution because we really wanted to get, you know, major festivals re-engaged, and I think that was that was a trigger for for them. Yeah, and that that is what brought my uh, thought to that since Jefferson County Board of Tourism was approached by Riverfest for their 20th anniversary. We contributed forty thousand dollars this year, and was uh, hoping for some sort of an investment from the city as well. Uh, Councilman, I would, you know, like to go through the capital planning process with you, 
before we uh, appropriate more funds for for tourism and I think with the the dollars the Board of Tourism and certainly the innkeeper tax that it's generating uh, there's you know that's a good source of funding as well as all the you know private contributions from corporate sponsors across the community to help all the events Are there any other questions on ARPA? More to come? Thank you. Sorry, Joe. Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to uh, public comments. Anybody here would like to address uh, council or the mayor's office? It'll be now your opportunities. Please come to the podium and introduce yourself be happy to receive any public statement at this time. Yes, sir. Rick Roos, 1421 Cherokee Court. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I, my request is, in the view of the skyrocketing gas prices, thank you, Brandon, but this, the state of Indiana doesn't seem like it, it really cares, and I, in particular the governor as far as the, the idea of lessening the, the, the burden of gas taxes. And I was wondering if you could be our ombudsman, I can say it, as well as engaging other Republican mayors to engage the executive as well as the legislative uh, body to alleviate this. Apparently, uh, the last time Holcomb was asked this. He for, for an Indiana governor to suspend the gas tax through a declaration of an emergency. The state must have an existing or projected energy shortfall that would jeopardize life, health, and property. We did, have not met this threshold as a month ago. Well, a lot of people are hurting with this stuff. And, I mean, he's been tone deaf on an awful lot of things. And I realize he's outgoing. You're, you're part of now. So I wish you'd goose them. Well, I appreciate your remarks there, and I can't you know, speak for the governor other than that what I've read is probably the same information you've read, Rick, which is he is working on some level of assistance plan, and certainly suspension of the gas tax has come up. He's not been in favor of. I, I hope that he is working on some other level of assistance because of the state of the uh, surplus that we have right now, and I'll certainly advocate for that. But the, you know, the legislature jacked that gas tax up when we were, you know, less of uh, an emergency, mm -hmm. but I'm just sitting there going, and I thought that was unfortunate then, it's just getting added on now to, to oh, I don't have anything to do with it. So, thanks, Bob. Oh, thank you. Are there any, anyone else? Is there anyone else who would like to uh, make a statement to council or mayor's office? Council, I just have a couple of things. I want to thank, uh, publicly thank, uh, State Representative Randy Fry, uh, Department of Natural Resource Director Terry Coleman, uh, Clifty Falls State Park Manager Natalie Brinson, and the OVO Executive Director Elena Freeman, as well as our Parks Department working together to solve um, an issue as it relates to Crystal Beach. You might have seen the announcement, but uh, OVO, OVO is now offering Indiana State Park entrance permits to income eligible households with children 17 and under. And they've also went one step further than that and are offering 2022 season passes good for 15 visits to the pool with, to Clifty Falls State Park. Uh, all of those organizations you know, saw that there's gonna be a need for summer swimming uh, particularly in the absence of Crystal Beach not being open this season. Uh, Girls Inc. and the Boys Club are also offering programs. And um, I believe that OVO has already identified all of the income eligible households. And they are also open June 6th, 7th, and 8th at their offices. So that people can come into the OVO office and apply to receive a uh, park pass, which is good for all the parks across the state, not just Clifty Falls but also a 15 visit uh, pool pass for Clifty Falls State Park. So happy that there's going to be some assistance there. Is and that income based? 
it, it, it's income based. Is there any transportation provided? Uh, there's no transportation. Um, it's 200% of the uh, poverty level in uh, in our community in Jefferson County for a family of four that would take you up to uh, an annual income limit of approximately $56,000. So is, is our Parks Department doing anything to offer any type of swimming or anything else we opted, standalone? No, I know. We uh, are working with directly with OVO, we can do the income certifications. We're, we are also working with the Department of Natural Resources. That alone, that program alone is going to be approximately 800 to 1,000 park entrances and it will probably be around 450 15 session pool passes. We have offered to OVO that if the demand is exceeded uh, by the limits that they have, um, the city the city would be interested in partnering with them to provide additional funding so that more pool passes could be granted. Uh, they are doing this uh, they are doing this in Jefferson County for the pool passes, uh, but they're also working with uh, uh, I think a four or five county area for state park entrance passes permits. But well, we are, the Parks Department is, Curtis, trying to still get possibly swim lessons and maybe the water aerobics uh, through the junior high. Junior we are high. still trying to work through yeah. with the schools. Uh, yeah, I know Councilman Dottillo at the last meeting and uh, brought up the idea of working with the schools to possibly bus kids to some of the local pools. It was in line with the same plan that I had sent to Parks Director Woolard as well as trying to coordinate getting our kids to some of those because I'm sure transportation is going to be the biggest need, not necessarily Well, it, it's interesting pass, because in, so. in talking about that with OVO, uh, they've indicated that transportation isn't generally an issue. Um, it is certainly, a, it, it raises more issues than it probably solves, primarily because there are supervision standards that DNR has with regards to kids coming in in transportation, in um, buses, for example. Uh, plus, it creates additional liability on the city. So we're going to work with OVO and DNR and see how this program will work. And as, as uh, Carlin indicated, we're also having conversations with uh, the schools with regards to keeping the junior high pool open so that there could be some level of swim lessons or um, uh, uh, water aerobics for our senior population. Wouldn't that liability be the same as when the Boys Club buses their kids down to Crystal Beach? Uh, if the boys club wants to take on that liability, sure. Yeah. It would be the same liability for the city at that point, right? Uh, well, I'm, it, are you saying? So when the Crystal you're... Beach is open and the Boys and Girls Club transports a busload of kids down there and they have volunteers and their staff monitoring their children that they've brought to the pool, how is that different than what the Parks Department could offer uh, at another pool location it's it's a liability we didn't want to take on and it was also a service that OVO had advised was not necessary right now uh, and with DNR they have specific supervisory requirements that if you're bringing additional kids into the pool and there was no way we could meet the supervisory requirements but Boys Club and Girls Inc I think are still offering some level of programs this summer so we encourage kids to contact them for that I uh, want to mention, too, that our Public Arts Commission uh, had its inaugural meeting last week, so we're happy to get that process kicked off in creating our guidelines for um, public art, which is an important process and, and progressing, you know, Madison into the, uh, uh, the arts movement and taking advantage of all the creative talent we have already here in Madison and the organizations that are supporting that. We also received a uh, $325,000 grant from the National Park Service for Paul Brune Historic Preservation Award, and that's going to be contributed to our PACE program. Excited about that because that will um, help homeowners who have heretofore been unable to participate in the PACE program because of the matching element to it. So there will be matching funds available to help assist uh, them uh, participate in our PACE program, and that's been extremely successful. Uh, lastly, I'll mention that IEDC will be hosting, hosting their monthly meeting here in Madison on June the 30th. So we're going to have a presence uh, uh, in front of the statewide organization, the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. As you know, we are working with the Southern Indiana RDA for our ready grants and destination development and workforce development plans. So we're, we're 
excited that IEDC has chosen Madison for their monthly meeting. And I'll pause there and answer any questions you might have. If not, well, our next council meeting is Tuesday, June the 21st. Seven o'clock, June fourteenth at Bicentennial. Okay, and there will be. I think that's when the community band is performing. Okay, at what time? Seven. Oh, seven o'clock. Any other announcements? We have a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I'll I second. second the motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you.